This is the OGM weekly call on Thursday, August 8th, 2024. Uh, I was just rambling on about how the news cycle seems to have tightened, gotten shorter, faster, in uh, certainly credit to uh, or damage done by the speed of social media and the speed of news and the speed of the internet's availability these days. Um, so that said, I'm curious about what everybody would like to talk about. So simple thought, uh, not only are planes hijacked, but the earth has been hijacked. Um, which takes me in lots of interesting directions. Um, which direction are you are you thinking that Anthropocene climate change hijacked the Earth's evolution, or do you mean some other thing? No, I think that the corporate culture uh, and finance have co-opted the Earth. And I'm not sure you'll find any debate on that in this call. Um, hey, Kevin. Hi, Stacey. Hey, Ramsey. Um, it's, it's an interesting way to frame the question, though, right? Is, yeah. is that what we want? Do we want uh, corporate capitalism? What's the question? To, uh, Doug's made the observation that, well, I don't know. You, you can probably summarize better, uh, Jerry, because you, you need to lead in with the hijacking thing. Um, so well, uh, the idea that the, the press about hijacking planes has drifted off asymptotically towards nothing led me to the idea that the earth itself has been uh, hijacked by corp by some aspects of corporate culture and finance. And we're living on that, and, but we're not reacting as though we are prisoners in a, in a cage. You know, I always get with you until you say, and we're not. And it's like you say the same, and we're not, and I'm real tired of it. So that's, that's just what you know, do you find that you engage people generatively if you start by condemning them? That's no, I would never question. start doing that with people. Sorry, Doug, what'd you say? How else to start? There are plenty of ways of engaging folks, and I think that's one of the important questions right now. So what does everybody want to talk about? Um, Doug suggested that the earth has been hijacked and I'm not sure exactly how to make that a topic. There's lots of questions that could spiral out of that. Um, what's on everybody's minds and hearts? Well, um, Ken, uh, hey, well, let's push it a step, a step further. And that is, since it's been hijacked, uh, it's put us on a course that's destructive for human civilization. And we're not reacting to that. So there's this um, crazy uh, paradox that we are now talking through technology that capitalism made available to us through a variety of infringements and impingements that we've ignored for a really long time. Uh, there are far worse things that capitalism seems to have done to us, uh, including endangering our lives and our planet. Um, and so we have, you know, on the, on the one hand, ain't capitalism good to us because cheap goods and like technologies like this, there's an argument to be pursued, which is maybe an argument for a different day, that capitalism is the only way these sorts of technologies would have become available, that the pressures and and uh, forces of capitalism are what gave us the uh, MacBook Pro that I am talking with you through now and the internet and everything else. I'm unclear that I, I believe that, um, but I'm interested in what other people think. Uh, Pete mentioned that I should uh, talk about Neobooks Pops on this call, which I will do. Uh, thanks, good idea. It's a, it's the top lead story in the, the Plex this week. Uh, Pete, go ahead. Um... Uh, thanks. Uh, Neil Book Pops is uh, cool. Uh, I'd like to hear about it. But I wanted to, uh, so I, I, it's an interesting premise, you know, um, corporate capitalism, oh my God, and whatever technology, the advance of technology has given us, you know, beautiful, wonderful things like MacBooks and LLMs and uh, Zoom so that we can all talk. I, you know, if, if I 
if I were able to go back uh, 5,000, 10,000 years or something and, and tweak something and say, um, I want an agrarian society where there's, uh, you know, uh, 10 million people or, or 50 million people on the planet um, and it's all pretty decentralized and information is slow um, or, uh, you know, I, I want technology, but then they're going to have to, the humans, the, the 8 billion humans on the planet are going to have to figure out how to, how to un-auger themselves. I would take the first one. So I, you know, as a technologist, I feel like this is a weird thing to say, but I, I'm not convinced that our technological life has led us anywhere good for humanity. Um, uh, it's super fun, <laughs> but it's super fun, kind of like a candy rush, you know, a sugar rush. It's like, yeah, so is my life better because I can Zoom with y'all? It is actually, I, I appreciate each of you and we are your respective uh, places around the world. But if I didn't have you, I would have people closer to me and maybe that would even be a better thing. So, uh, so anyway, um, I, the, you know, the, I, I don't, I, I wanna make sure that we don't let the, but look at all the wonderful things that we've got um, distracts us from, did we really ever re need these wonderful things? Um, so I, I don't think we did. So there's a general question we could address in this call of has technology been more harmful than helpful, which would be really interesting. Um, comments on that or other suggestions. And for those of you who've just joined the call, uh, we're kind of topic hunting right now. And we've touched a couple different things. Um, and at some point soon, we will be into something. But uh, all suggestions welcome. Ken, please go ahead. Hello, everybody. Uh, sorry, I've been gone the last couple of weeks. Uh, Welcome back. I was in, thank you. I was in Austin two weeks ago, and then I was going to be on the call last week, but I, I woke up at three in the morning and came back to sleep, and I, I lay down on the couch at 7.30, so I was just going to close my eyes for a minute. Next thing it was 10.30, so I slept to it. Um, related to what Pete just said, <clears throat> in uh, The Nutmeg's Curse, um, Amitav Ghosh says, you know, the basically um, we're engaged in a project of the omnicide. You know, our way of being in the world, the Western industrialized way of being in the world, kills everything in its path. And so that might also be an interesting uh, approach to take. With not just it goes beyond it's been technology more helpful than harmful, but we, Dave Weitzel and Klaus and I are going to interview Liz Carlisle next week uh, about her book, Healing Grounds. And um, a really strong case can be made for the fact that the way that we have uh, come to be in the world where we've we no longer see the world as alive, as uh, mystical, as enchanted, and as a relation to us, has led us to this ability to see the world as inert and uh, to be used by us, regardless of the consequences, to um, destroy, you know, mountaintops, to dig up uh, coal and burn it and put it in the atmosphere, and you know, do all these horrible things. So, um, I just thought I'd throw that in there. And we've floated before the topic of resacralization of our relationships to people and the earth and nature, which I like a lot. Uh, so I'll put that on the table as well here. Uh, Carl, please. Uh, interesting topic is uh, uh, Ray Anderson um, passed on uh, August 8th, um, 2011. He founded... Uh, interface carpet and he really had uh he's my example of um what i frame as uh as paradigm leaks he had um in fact it was funny because i found uh, a um when i was going through to get rid of old equipment at general service administration i found that i opened up this one cardboard box and it was a bunch of VHS tapes of an interview that our public building service commissioner had done with him back in 2002. And he just, I mean, he, he talking about like 292 years ago. So he was going back to 1710 with the, with the steam engine and um, right up to, and he says like sustainability is not enough that's like do no more harm. We need to get to restorative, helping the planet heal. That's how he was thinking 20, like 25 years ago. And uh, um, so there's a, a lot of um, links 
that I can that I'll post in. In fact, I've dedicated my um, cover photo um, as a diagram that I um, that was inspired by his 2009 TED Talk, and I gather a lot of links there. I'll I can post them in here or post them to the listserv later and things. But yeah, as I said, I mean, he, um, just amazing. And I mean, Kuhn, uh, he had the 1957 book about the Copernican revolution. So structure was all about that things are incommensurable, that thing, it's a, a rip and replace mindset. But uh, but what Ray Anderson is, and that's why uh, the paradigm leap is that he is counterintuitive in some ways, but then it's that he was he was able to um, actually establish a blueprint for where we need to be going, and that it was it's like um, embrace and extend. So I mean, there's some very fundamental things there about mind shift. I'll stop there, but um, thanks, Carl. Kevin. Sorry, my my Zoom is going really strange on me. Anyway, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Because the, the picture is going back and forth. I guess I'll just stop video or, or something just because it's making me go crazy. Um, anyway. This is a vote for resacralization. Uh, the Anderson Foundation that we were just talking about is one of the ones that's interested in funding our rights of nature work here in North Carolina. And we're doing a festival to, uh, you know, uh, Swannanoa River Revival uh, that we hope they'll be, the college is leading and the town of Black Mountain is doing. And it's about changing the relationship. You know, uh, rights of nature means that it's not a commodity. You know, it is, you are in relationship. And so there's lots of indigenous people leading different parts of it because he said, this is just a codification of the way we see things, you know, relationships of reciprocity and stuff. And, you know, white folks are putting this frame around it, which is, you know, we come from our culture. But anyway, that's a, a recent, what we're finding is uh, with this rights of nature stuff is that you have to just really think about who you are in the world and how you relate to the world in some new way uh, that uh, acknowledges stuff you can't see between you and the river or whatever that you're that you're in relationship with a visible and non visible world <clears throat> and. Um, and the indigenous, uh, yeah, sure, okay, that's fine. Uh, you know, so what, and so we're trying to put it in, into some bills around some rivers uh, in the state uh, legislature. Uh, and uh, so we're, we're, we're going to do a Swannanoa River bill uh, as well. But anyway, vote for resacralization re seems to really be something that makes sense to me. Even if it's too hard to pronounce. Right. Um, exactly. Uh, there's a, there's a twist on it that if we go there, I'd like to explore. I just want to put it I'm on the table. I just want to put it I'm on the table. I'm going to quit and come back. I don't know. Something's weird. Something's weird for YouTube. Okay. Um, there's a twist on it that interests me a lot, which is about the current, uh, uh, anti-abortion movement, basically the, the right to life movement and the sort of, um, sacralization of of fetuses, um, and it, which is turning out into a movement against IVF and a bunch of other uh, kind of, to my mind, sort of, well, to my mind, my my particular mind, um, kind of crazy things, which are dysfunctional and destructive to living humans. So I think that resacralization has to have an interesting conversation, a meaningful conversation about what are we saying is sacred and how does that work? Like what, what functionally, what do we mean by that? Because there's a piece of it that's simple that I love. There's a piece of it that's really complex that gets into some of these issues about what is life, what is consciousness, what are we protecting, what are the costs, all of that. Uh, Dave. Yeah, I was just kind of thinking about something Carl was saying about um, Anderson and, and paradigm shifts. And I've been wondering a little bit about uh, what 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 transformative change means. I mean, I feel like we have critiques of capitalism and things like that. And there's bad things we'd like to have different. But, you know, what does it mean to be significantly different, have, be on a different trajectory, kind of? And, you know, how do you know and how do you get there? And what as an individual do you choose to do in that context? Um 
<clears throat> and I'd love to kind of put together some 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 pa a paper or something on this stuff if anybody is in the mood. But you know, things like we talk about the the straw that broke the camel's back, right? Which we put a lot of priority on the last straw. But there must have been a lot of other straws there. You know, somebody put other straws there first. We just give credit to the last one. Um, or, or you know, the, I think a lot of transformation notion. It really is an exponential curve, right? We we probably have a you know, there's been uh, iterative, and it's been an iterative process, but it's been an iterative process on an exponential curve. And if you are at the beginning of the curve, right, you don't know if you're moving because it's really flat. And as you get higher up the curve, you seem like you're moving a lot. So a bunch of the difference is what, when did you jump onto the curve, right? If you start at the flat part and you're just struggling away, you don't know if you're making progress. If you jump onto the steep part, you look like you're making huge progress, but that's because somebody already built the curve for you. You know. Anyway, I, I just just you like how do we kind of wrestle with these things in, in our own personal behavior? Um, and then I don't know if it's connected or not, but I was really struck by it. There was a a pretty fun uh, speech by uh, Rafael Nadal. I don't even think I say his name right. The tennis player uh -huh. he gave the commencement <laughs> at Dartmouth, I guess this year, uh, tennis lessons, and uh, it's a good twenty minute talk. But one of the things he said was that he uh, won 80% of his matches over his career. Pretty good record. He won, he says, 54% of his points. It's actually not Nadal. It's, um, what's his name? Uh, the German. Swiss, I think he was Swiss. Swiss. Thank you. Yes, Federer. Uh, it's Federer. It's, 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 Federer. it's Federer's speech, and it's great. It's a yeah, it's, it's really good. It's a good listen. But like to you know, it's just this notion that the fifty four percent of points is enough to win eighty percent of matches. Seems like there's an insight in there for what it means to have trans. Like transformative change is probably still at the margin, right? I mean, like Texas is a blue state. I mean, Texas is a red state because like fifty five percent of the state votes red. Um, you know, it's 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 really kind of a small change in some sense. So anyway, I've been just trying to figure out what transformation means and, and the Ray Anderson stuff provoked me. Um, thanks, Dave. Um, from what you were talking about on the curve, um, by the time you realize the trend is exponential, it is very often too late to intervene. You need to make choices about whether something is exponential or not relatively early in the process to try to stop it. This is the problem with pandemics, for example, is that when, hey, there's only like six patients, we shouldn't worry and lock down. Uh, turns into, oh my gosh, everybody's got this thing uh, very, very quickly. And a lot of people, I think that we give credit for dramatic change. We're just jumped onto the curve at the right thought. Uh, exactly. Uh, well, like the US in World War One, we were like anti-intervention, anti-everything. We jump in at the very last minute, have the Battle of Belleau Wood, and then are hailed as conquering heroes at the end of the war, like we won the thing when everybody else duked it out and lost all the humans. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> it's weird. You get on at the right moment, you get all the credit. That's a good human attribute. Uh, so if we go back to either re-enchantment or re-sacralization, has anybody read Stigler's book? I put the title of it. I have not read it, but I put the title in the chat, The Re-Enchantment of the World, The Value of Spirit Against Industrial Populism from 2014. Uh, anybody ever read that? That sounds like a, a nice starting point for, for that kind of conversation. Um, what thoughts does all that bring up for us? Have we, so it's weird. Science comes from the word, the same root word that scissors comes from. Science is about separation. It's about cutting things apart from each other. Uh, religion comes from legio, and I think I'm stealing some of Doug, Doug C's uh, etymology stuff here. Uh, religion is about rebinding, reconnecting, because legio is like it, ligature or ligament, uh, is about binding. And it seems like we've separated the two a lot. We've separated our spirituality and our science, and, and often they're really at odds when we need some kind of a binding science. We need some kind of way of seeing the world that sees and appreciates its relationships and it's unmeasurables as well as a data-oriented way uh, or an evidence-based, if I will use the more current term, way of moving forward with decisions that we make for ourselves that affect everybody. Klaus? Yeah, I think that comes to mind. Uh, Erdverbundenheit yeah, means being connected uh, to the soil, being connected to the earth. 
Um, I, I mean, really, the 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 uh, separation of uh, na uh, from nature yeah, that's so dominating uh, our culture and our time today is what has gotten us into into this bind you now. And what really uh, hit me, you know, I worked in China for like ten years, and I just got drawn into a, a project in China where they realized that um, um, they are in in really serious trouble because they imported American industrial agricultural methods into into China uh, and have destroyed you know forty percent of their soil already. Uh, so they are at risk of losing their yields they 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 are sufficient self sufficient or they don't are not self sufficient in the first place, but they're losing their ability to produce sufficient food uh, and Within two three years, that could be catastrophic, and the Chinese have been so linked, you know, historically over thousands of years of culture, have been so linked to an an, an understanding of of uh, nature, the natural world. It's so deeply embedded, you know, in their religion and their culture and everything that it's really it's really traumatic to see how. Uh, they that derailed in a really short period of time you know it took maybe about 40 years or so uh, to to get this and they the reason why they they are there is because when the western world came in it's not just the us but the europeans when the west came in uh, they embraced everything you know the technology they thought everything we do is better and and of course short term you know, their agricultural yields increased dramatically with the use of synthetic nitrogen and so on. Uh, but now here are the consequences. And so I think this is really the the a, a defining moment, you know, in, in our history uh, to recognize that the biosphere is a living thing. We are a component, we are part of and dependent on the biosphere in in and we we have to figure out how to save it and how to how to turn that around. Uh, so so I see that you know as as the core theme uh, to 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 embrace here. Thanks, Klaus. Um, one of the things that jumps out if you start reading <clears throat> in indigenous things uh, is how bound to the land indigenous ways of being and thinking are, uh, how how much the land is involved. And then we, if we bring technology in, we bring sort of uh, transportation, we bring uh, policies like enclosure movements. Oh yeah, we need to move people off these fields because we need the fields for sheep grazing or whatever. Mass migrations, forced migrations, and basically sh shifting people off their land has always been traumatic and seems to be part and parcel of uh, uh, progress, um, but certainly you know uh, the darker side of progress. Um, and so, Another angle on this is that healthy land takes time. Uh, you have to want to be there for a couple generations in order to take care of it and and have the payoffs that that arrive as you improve the land. Um, and very often, all of our all of our mechanisms are very short termist, and we do very little long term thinking. I'm surprised at the recent backlash against long term thinking and long termism. Somehow that got hijacked and co opted the wrong way. I think we should all be thinking really long term, like seven generations front and back, or whatever. Uh, Ken has a pointer to a really good essay about uh, that he wrote about seven about the seven generations aspect. Um, Rimsey. Um, yeah, to to you know to Doug's point and and the last point as well. Um, the Earth is being captured. You know, we are we've always even you know in the beginning the agricultural game that we were playing may have been distributed uh, and it wasn't concentrated because it was uh, because of the lack of you know technology information uh, and, and and communication but we have always been fighting to own the the commons to own the earth and so today what we have of course is we have concentrated ownership in, in the hands of corporations and nations and these fictional entities and so how do we go about reclaiming the commons uh, whereby we're playing a, a game where in order to uh, access anything that's produced from the commons through our social uh, activity and social labor, that things that go into the market, right? Market goods, food, uh, and other commodities. How do then we, like, what is the, um, what is the blood? 
the, the currency from which we use to exchange, our, you know, in, in, to record our interactions with one another um, about all the resources of the world. So if we're going to reclaim the commons, if we're going to play another game, then it requires a distribution of the currency in a different form than distributing the currency based on our rivals, rivalrousness over the resources in exchange, right? So we're basing all of our currency, our value of a human, based on our ability to exchange and, and, and capture things privately. So we've turned everything into an asset, a commodity, uh, and we're continually to fight over those things. And it's the only basis of, of, uh, of currency. But then, you know, in modern times with, with technology and, and math and double entry bookkeeping, we discovered credit. So credit isn't new. It, it is a, the basis of a currency that we, we could issue uh, to each other that isn't based on the exchange of the stuff. And so how do we, how do we do that? How, you know, like that's what I'm attempting to do. This is my uh, like mission is to, to switch our economics so that we are no longer uh, fighting and suffering the tragedy of the unmanaged commons writ large. This is what I see in the world. We're, we're all competing and fighting over the world to our detriment. And, and, and as long as all those things are private, then they can't be managed collectively and cooperatively because we don't own them together. They're owned by those other people. And by definition, something being private means that we're external to those decisions. And we can't be external to those decisions because the earth is internal. It's, a, it's an extension of our body, just like Ramsey's, you know, this body, you know, Ramsey's a part of this body. Ramsey's also a part of the earth. I, you know, I can't survive without the earth as well. It's the same thing as far as I'm concerned. They're, they're, they're connected. And so Ramsey's disconnected from the earth, just like you, we all are. We're not a part of it. It's not ours. You know, only whatever the owners say and whatever they dictate. Um, anyway, sorry about the rant. It's okay. Thanks for sharing your grand vision again with us, Ramsey. Um, it's big. Uh, Doug. So uh, part of the problem is that the Earth is covered with a grid which divides the Earth into parcels of ownership. And every single part of the Earth has a grid on top of it. And an interesting question is, OK, who owns that grid? Now, second point, unrelated, is uh, an assumption behind what most people here are saying is the idea that if we get it right, we can fix it. Uh, I am very skeptical. I think we are not gonna be able to fix it. So we need to do something different, which is living with the consequences of not being able to fix it. End of thought. Um, in which case we should invite Jem Bendel and the Deep, Deep Adaptation crew into the call and just uh, focus on that or I don't know, Doug, if you've been in any of their conversations or their thinking, but that's what they're all about. There's a whole crew of people who are like, well, we've screwed this. We better learn to live with the consequences of our actions. How do we do that? So uh, Jem Bendel, whom I've met, is a smart guy, uh, but he's busy doing exactly that. Uh, Jose. Uh, Rems yeah, he's very interesting, and I do pay attention. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Remzi, your hand is still up from earlier. Thank you. Uh, Jose. Thank you for saying it that way, even though that's not the way you say it, but that, that was good. Um, only because I was born in Portugal and it's Jose, but- Oh, uh, it's Jose. Oh, I, I, so I, I grew up yeah, in yeah. America, so for me it's Jose, but Jose, si, si. I will be changing my pronunciation. <laughs> I, I just tease you because it's it's fun. Um, I, like, I like the conversation around life because I think that's the word we've all been sort of skirting around, um, nature, science. Um, and um, I, I think there's actually an opportunity for maybe the first time in human history to bring those two things together. Um, two things meaning... Um, the sacredness of life, therefore religion, um, and the understanding of life uh, from a scientific perspective. And one of the things that I really, really like when I have conversations around this topic, um, let me see if I can put it here. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this tree of life, um, but there is 
I can never pronounce it right. Um, there is this beautiful um, chart of life going back to the first cells. And when you think about it, each and every one of our cells comes from another cell, which comes from another cell, which comes from another cell. And therefore, I think that that relationship that we all seek from a religious perspective as sort of like a belief is, is known scientifically and, and obviously that, that I've come from my parents and they came from their parents and so on and so on and so on and all the way back. And so there is there's this relationship to life that we don't usually talk about. And so my, my question is, how do we take that understanding, both the, the religious understanding of life as sacred, but the scientific understanding as life as one, and, and have a different conversation around all the work that we're doing, one that is informed by that understanding and that simplicity. It's, it's not that complex, right? It's a, it's a fairly straightforward merging of these two belief systems um, that I think is, is from most of the time that I've used that um, in presentations and, and conversations, most people uh, accept that as a, a viable way forward. I find it a very, very interesting uh, direction to think about. How do we have that unity conversation? Thank you. Thanks, Josie. Oh, I love that. Thanks for telling me. Uh, Stacy. Yeah, well, to answer Jose's question, I think that I think the difficulty with that, that's where you have to take money out of the conversation. Because I think that where we get separated from spirit is where we get taken away from our childlikeness. Um, where we get taken away from our imagination. Um, everything that separates me from spirit, for example, are the things that aren't practical. Everything that I've been told, well, that doesn't make sense in the real world. Um, those are the things that we've been trained. You know, it doesn't make sense because we live in this world where everything, you know, has a different value to it. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that I can put everything to words, but I think we have to take, I mean, the reason I'm always geared towards games is only because it allows us to be in our imagination and to remove money, because I don't think we can come up with the proper solutions when we're trapped in the idea of we need to produce because it just it just skews our thinking in a way that um yeah just it skews our thinking yeah you know, I'll, I'll stop there for now um thanks stacy i think this is a build on what you're saying if not um correct me please but my primitive my primitive understanding of babies and what they see and perceive uh i think we're born fully connected into the universe. We're born uh, kind of birthed out of whatever energy uh, has us. And we, we, when we start to see when our vision flips and some of the physics of how our eyes are wired to our, through our nerves, to our brain, when that all starts to work, I think babies actually see auras and see the world a lot more like somebody on a good LSD trip um, today. Uh, and then we proceed to tell them what is real and what is not. Then we proceed to socialize them. And for me, the process of socialization um, does uh, two very opposite things. One, it makes them, it mainstreams them into being good citizens in their particular society, whatever that means. And different societies have really different rules of operation and belief systems. But socialization mainstreams them into their culture, but it also cuts away all the different aspects of all the other ways of seeing the world, all the other forms of experience, et cetera. And when you're in a very, uh, I will call us a rational culture, a very rational, scientific, linear, uh, uh, left-brained paternalistic culture like Western civilization. Gosh, every word I say is like a little landmine. Um, 
we don't have that and we've cut away all those other ways of being uh, and one way that this is manifested is babies go through a phase called echolalic babbling where they make the sounds of every language known to men and then we teach them our language and then at 13 we start teaching them like oh now you're going to learn french except by 13 the muscles in your throat have uh, uh, wired up and your brain centers are different and you can no longer make the little u and r sounds from other languages um so why and then and then there's lots of people who believe you shouldn't teach children lots of languages because it'll just confuse them turns out kids kids sort most of this out um, if, I anyway, just, we, yeah, if i ahead, could just add, if i could just add one thing yeah. when you guys were talking before i was thinking to myself i wish they were all on mushrooms and i could just say to them what if our currency was love and i could just remind them that the body keeps the score so that's an idea for a future call <laughs> Um, I just want to mention and briefly go ahead um Bobby McFerrin used to do this 24-hour singing thing at Grace Cathedral when he was here in, in the Bay Area and I went a couple times and one day he was talking about he, he told this story of being in Africa and you know he does all this different vocalizations and this woman came up to him and said how is it that you know the language of our ancestors and he mm -hmm. said I don't she said well you're using you're making the same sounds it's a very secret language only the initiated know it and he his explanation is in just allowing himself to explore anything that came to mind in terms of vocalizations he just he was able to recover these things that it exists there as a as a language that that not many people know but it's there and he was able to tap into it so when you started talking about babies and babbling that just came to mind and you were referring to bobby mcferrin correct okay thank you i missed i missed you said it quickly so i just wanted to confirm yeah, he used um, to do a 24-hour sing-along for new year's eve at grace cathedral in uh san francisco where you could just go and Go sing with Bobby McFerrin. It was pretty cool. Wow. I think Jacob Collier is like the modern Bobby McFerrin, sort of, but different in, in a weird way, at least in the audience interaction way. That, that's for sure. Well, Bobby's still here. So he's, you know, and he's still pretty modern, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm sad we don't do more Bobby McFerrin kind of things. Uh, Doug. Yeah. The problem with the DNA narrative that one cell comes from another is it supports the idea that life is getting increasingly complex. And I think that's a mistake. Uh, I think the life of hunter-gatherers was in many ways more complex than ours. And that uh, we've got to hold on to or explore those beliefs. Otherwise, they're excluded from the conversation because they don't fit the idea that the modern is the source of complexity. There's a general trope that things are just getting increasingly complex. And I'm like, yeah, if we had dropped you into a, a place on Earth like 500 years ago, you wouldn't have lived very long uh, unless you'd understood a lot of complex things. Uh, anyway, um, so I agree with you, Doug. Um, Klaus. Yeah, I just uh, posted my favorite uh, Tolstoy letter to a Hindu uh, which you have to scroll down between the foreword that was written by Mahatma Gandhi, and then you go further into it, and then also Rifkin, you know, the empathic civilization. The the it, both really argue that we are a, an empathic species, but that our our culture, our civilization, our interactions suppress the empathic impulse. Um, and as we as we uh, lose this empathy, and then when you think really in business, right, uh, the the whole idea to prioritize shareholder value to uh, over everything else, right? I mean that is a rejection of empathy as part of the decision making process. So so our entire uh, economy, uh, our way of interacting is really. Uh, depriving us of of this relationship and relational way of of uh, of interacting, and that's also a big reason why we have lost uh, the understanding of nature. You know the suffering we are inflicting on uh, animals, on uh, you know uh, other living things that could be microbes in the soil, right? Which are all a vital component of life. So this this lack of this this killing off of empathy in our in our culture is really a driving force of the alienation that we have you now from nature. Coming back to Heidegger, Erdverbundenheit, and so. 
Thanks, Lars. All right, Kevin. You're still muted, Kevin. Yeah, on complexity, you know, I had to spend a couple of years writing about aquaculture. And uh, one of the best ways to do it is in raceways where the water circulates really fast. And there were only two in the country that worked. And they would become and they would be studied by all these students from the colleges and they would measure this in a test tube and all that. But really what they were managing, managing uh, the people who were making it work was this huge algae bloom that was the efficient filter. And so they had to manage the gestalt of a mass of algae and all the ways they could see color that meant health and not health. And so they were keeping you know, the, bacteria, the algae uh, blooming and going. And nobody, they, the folks from the college didn't know how to look at the whole thing. And, you know, the, the, the folks who did this were like, you know, kind of ruminant, you know, guys in overalls, you know, who weren't really uh, articulate, but they knew how to manage uh, the whole gestalt uh, and look that way. And they, did, you know, all the folks who wanted to put it down into a test tube thing would replicate it and, and lose all their money because they didn't know, you know, they, they had too much school, you know? I mean, the problem was, you know, uh, the folks who managed algae blooms uh, had, didn't have to unlearn anything. Love that, Kevin. There's so many things about how systems work that we used to know that we've lost that were interesting, useful, what I call hard won knowledge. Because, you know, it, it took the Incas a bunch of generations to figure out how to do terrace farming. And nobody can really do terrace farming anymore because we've lost that capacity. It, it all it all got stamped out. Um, but it kept them alive and it gave us potatoes. Um, Jose. <laughs> um, kept them alive and gave us potatoes. I love that. You know, that's, that's, a good the, line. Essence, that's the essence of everything. Um, uh, it just... works well for the Irish, though. Yeah. yeah. Well, the problem is that, that Europeans only brought two kinds of potato back to Europe, and there were 400 to choose from, and they had a monocrop. Sorry. And we've been doing the same ever since. Yep, yep. That's how we think. We don't we don't figure this out. The, the Spaniards conquer Mexico, don't see cochineal, which is under their noses. The peasants are busy farming this little bug that, that infests the nopal cactus, which is like very tiny and light and makes the most beautiful color red all the way up to the you know crimson robes of the of the bishops they don't see it for 150 years they don't realize that these peasants are doing something important that's more valuable than the gold and jewels that they're looking for just right underfoot um my apologies I, no you, no did, that was me okay that was you um I would just doug's comment first of all uh, totally agree with the uh the complexity thing um it's only gotten more complex because we've made it more complex. Um, and that's partially intentional based on what um, was just described as far as by Kevin, as far as the fact that we slice and dice and, and try to make sense of things rather than being attentive to what's happening. And I think that doesn't actually uh, go against the, the understanding of life. I think it actually supports the understanding of life. Um, that life itself evolved to cope with all of this um, sensing and responding and has done so for millennia. Um, and the, now we've said, well, let's get life out of the way and let's put logic as, as the primary focus. And when we do that, we will figure it all out. I think the shift back to life is a shift back to understanding that life itself has the means by which to, to do a lot of the fixing that we need to fix or the coping that we need to do uh, to, to Doug's point. So my, my sense is that it's not one or the other, but that it is a shift back from one end of the pendulum back towards a center where there's a balance between the understanding that life has what it takes to do life well, or else we wouldn't be here. Um, and that the emergence of our ability to symbolize the world is a benefit to life, not 
against life. And that's where we went wrong. We thought that the symbolism actually was more than life itself. And I think our realization is that symbolic thought has actually created this problem. And how do we bring that back into balance? That symbolic thought is here to help life, not to supplant it or replace it. Sorry. <laughs> no, thank you. I don't know if that made any sense. Uh, it does. Don't apologize, please. That was useful. Um, and there's a whole other interesting thread to follow about language, the uses of language, the effects of language, and what does a post-writing world look like if there can be such a thing, which I don't want to dive into. But um, but how we communicate anything to one another is, is uh, deeply important. And we're in the culture where the best thing you can do is write it down in a logical way and, and transmit it to someone else in a book or something like that. Which brings me to the to our sponsor for this call. <laughs> <laughs> Pete, that's very funny. Um, so uh, Jose and Pete and a couple other folks and I and occasionally Dave Witzel uh, and Klaus all the time are in a call on Mondays called Neobooks. Uh, and we decided this last Monday, and Stacy occasionally as well, uh, we decided this past Monday to do what we're calling pops, which is, remember thunderclaps from way back when? In early social media days, everybody would swap uh, social media accounts and somebody would write a post and everybody would then retweet, repost, like it, whatever. We'd all kind of get, get behind it. Uh, we'd like to do that plus a front-end uh, effort of... Uh, offering one another feedback on the post before we do the actual post and then uh, thunderclap it. So there's a piece of, of collaborative writing to it. Uh, the, the notion is actually on a page in the OGM wiki. Uh, Pete cross-posted it into the Plex. Uh, so you'll see it in today's Plex that just came out uh, as one of the stories. And uh, there, is a, there is a Google form which leads to a Google spreadsheet which will show anybody who's got a submission for uh, popping that we will then go over on Mondays. And if there's too many, then we'll pick between them. Otherwise, whatever shows up will be there. Uh, Pete just posted a, a link to the Plex. And uh, all of that to say that the Neobooks project is an attempt to improve how ideas work in the world. Because on the assumption or the uh, on the narrative that ideas are kind of being handicapped uh, all over the place by our, our you know, over over protecting intellectual property, by wrapping them in digital rights management, by making them hard to sort of move around and use and reuse and improve. And uh, uh, the books part of Neobooks is kind of just cultural bait because everybody knows what a book is. The real idea is how do we come back in community uh, into sharing how to make ideas better and, and useful. So that's uh, basically a, a piece of it. And anybody who'd like to add to that, please do. There being no further comments on that, um, join us if you'd like and help pop or, su or submit <clears throat> an article into the, that Google form and uh, then show up for one Neobooks call. That is a perfectly legit way of doing this. Uh, and we will see what we can do to help you. Um, and George Poor has already submitted something. That's fabulous. Thanks, Pete. Uh, Klaus. Yeah, and maybe point out that uh, we would love to have a particular emphasis on the upcoming election. Yes. Um, so I already started a new neo book you know, focused specifically on the election, and I set up a, a specialized GPT uh, that is doing research on. Um, the uh, MAGA movement and on uh, you know, the entrenchment they have in uh, infiltrating the electoral process and so on and so on. And so, and then also, so I'm now also already pivoting into what are those kinds of strategies you could recommend to counter that. Now, and I think because since we're working with an open AI, uh, you know, getting into these kinds of conversations also. Uh, informs the AI about uh, what is happening here. So hopefully there are many conversations taking place along those lines, because I think when deep shit, <laughs> you know, um, it seems to be pretty clear by now that the, the MAGA movement doesn't even anticipate winning the election. They're going to take it. Now, 
um, you already so so be damn well better be prepared for that because uh, there are so many uh, um, examples throughout history you know, where people just got rolled up uh, on on this. I mean, just think about um, what's the the country next to the Ukraine, Russia, Ukraine. Um, the, the the guys that have an election, I might have, I might have a uh, Poland, Belarus, Belarus, right? Belarus, yeah, yeah. So they had an election, and the election was just being negated, right? I mean, people rising up, making lots of noise, and getting pushed down and beaten down. So there are plenty of examples, right, where you have uh, legitimate elections, and somehow they just. Uh, become uh, meaningless and and taken taken over that could happen to us right i mean the the the, uh, the american electoral process is so quirky uh, and there are so many loose ends here that uh, are based basically on uh, this is how we do things and then someone comes along and says well let's not right and then you're in trouble so so i think it's a good idea to just think stuff through and and engage the ai in in uh in working with that thanks Thomas. where uh, is that i'm sorry where where is that where can i find that find which thing what class was talking about Klaus, do you have any pointers um, on the neo book i published uh, the link to the to this new neo book on the uh the Mattermost, uh, uh channel on the new book channel we will find the link and post it here uh, thank you i think you called it the the war game right yeah cool we will find that thank you um other and and um klaus thank you so much for adding the uh direction for the pops we wanted to uh have the pops as much as possible be focused on the election cycle and what to do about it uh, or its implications, or any any other thing around it, but but kind of the next stretch through from here to November to Election Day. Doug, the it seems to me that the Harris campaign is caught in a bit of a trap. On the one hand, it's going to try and take on the Biden agenda of growing the green economy to create more jobs. At the same time, growing the green economy creates more CO two, and there is no path through this that makes sense. So it's going to be chaotic. Doug, is there any policymaking body? I'm not going to say nation on earth. I'm going to say policymaking body on earth that has proposed a path forward that meets your criteria. No. So my conclusion is there's none possible. And we have to live with the consequences. We should invite Jim Bendel to the call then. Um, thanks. Uh, anyone else? And feel free to turn our topic uh, in a new direction or add some other things that have come up in your minds and hearts to the conversation. We have a, another half hour together. Let me give an, an example of some of the difficulty we're in. I was today in a meeting. I'm in Malaysia at the moment. I was in a meeting in Malaysia with education people and some Silicon Valley people who have a program which takes the grade school curriculum and divides it, divides it into 300 modules, which uh, the students are encouraged to engage with uh, in a free and open and playful way, but they're bound in by the content of each module. Uh, it, it seemed to me like a perfect plan for how to have AI take over the teaching role because it can handle those modules so easily. Now, the interesting thing is, what was the, what's the motive of the people involved? Well, for the Silicon Valley people, it's to make a, a profit out of selling education programs. But for the people in Malaysia, it's more complicated. The problem here is that, that uh, there is a labor shortage, uh, which can probably be traced to uh, low salaries. So jobs are going wanting. Uh, and when people are good engineers in the pro programming and chip world, they're being picked off by other countries at higher salaries. So the view in Malaysia is we've got to train more engineers so that they can't be picked off 
And what that means is having engineers competing with each other for the few jobs, uh, which seems to me a pretty corrupt conclusion, but that's the structure. Uh, now in this, there is a lot of rhetoric about how wonderful knowledge is, how wonderful science is, and how wonderful it is to teach kids how to do these modules, all motivated by Let's have more engineers so the supply demand curve shifts and there's more supply and we can keep salaries lower. Uh, you've just opened a couple of different interesting Pandora's boxes, Doug. Um, I have some very um, libertarian capitalist friends who would say that just stop all the regulations, stop all the trouble, just let sort of let capitalism take care of these sorts of things. And I, I kind of want to pose this question to them. It's like, well, great, how, do, how, does, how does this happen? Like, why, why aren't wages rising in Malaysia? I think that the way, to, the way to hold Malaysian workers in Malaysia is to help them earn something close to a, a lifestyle that they would have somewhere else. Because let's say they come to the, to, to the Bay Area, let's say they get poached away to the Bay Area, they're going to have to put up with the Bay Area's cost of living, which is whack-a-noodle. Um, so Malaysia's cost of living is considerably different. You don't need to earn a, you know, a Silicon Valley worker salary there, but why aren't the salaries rising to that? Well, it's probably buried in the economy in 15 different places or in regulations or in culture or who knows. Um, but there's a bunch of interesting questions uh, around what you're asking. And also, um, I, I thought when you started your comment that you were going to talk about, hey, we could have chat GPT tutor these modules, I thought you were going to go to the energy cost of having ChatGPT even do that. And the notion that we would want to do that as a tremendous carbon creator and uh, danger to the to the planet. So and you didn't, you didn't, you didn't take that path, which was like surprising to me. Um, Jose. Uh, well, you just introduced something else. So, so I, I think that the, the cost of ChatGPT as far as the, the power cost is actually um, a red herring. Um, yes, it, uh, it, it does take more to do a chat GPT answer, but that chat GPT answer is 15, 20, 30 minutes of Googling. So, um, if, if you're lucky, um, so if you can get your answer in, in one search on chat GPT on one query on chat GPT versus 15, 20 minutes of surfing around the web, um, then you're much better off because you've saved yourself time and you saved a lot of energy in the, in the process. So you can turn um, to the next chat GPT search so much quicker. Well, it depends on what you're trying to do, right? Just if just if just you're trying to get answers um, and chat GPT can actually give you answers rather than links, which you then have to surf for a, a long period of time on different people's servers uh, to be able to get those answers then, um, then I, I think really we're we're sort of looking at two different things. Mm -hmm. um, the GPT that I have developed gives you links. It, it provides you with links to the articles that it draws from. So I just yeah. posted that that uh, GPT here that's it's already equipped with Lao Tzu and and uh, the art of war and all this good stuff. So. I have to run. I'm sorry, but uh... Thank, thanks, Thanks, Toss. I'm just sitting here thinking: Is Lao Tzu grinning right now, or spinning in his grave? <laughs> <laughs> he's grinning <laughs> because he he sees it, he saw it coming. You know, that's true. Um, but what actually got me to raise my hand was how quickly we reinforce the system we have when we have these conversations. Right? We started. Uh, with with Doug saying how uh, profits here in Silicon Valley and uh, the desire for cheaper uh, jobs there or, or people who are cheaper there, so on and so forth. And then the answer was, well, we need to think about how they manage employees and and we're or labor or like we we're still stuck in this idea that um, there that humans are labor, 
And we keep getting stuck in that idea. And we're for the reasons that that we are in the middle of that world. But how do we extract ourselves from this thinking where every time we talk about how we move things forward, we draw back to this economic model of there's a whole bunch of labor and how do we manage that labor and people are labor and we have to train them to be labor and we have to teach them to be labor and we have to manage their labor. That's not life, right? Um the video I've posted online that's gotten the most views, which is like 35,000 views or something silly like that, is about The Great Transformation, one of my favorite books, which is Carl Polanyi's, uh, Michael Polany uh, Polanyi's, uh, sorry, Carl Polanyi's um, description of early industrial society. And he says, look, uh, early industrial society invents three new fictitious commodities, land, labor, and money. Before the Industrial Revolution, People are tied to the land They're, and land is owned by the church or the king or somebody like you, there's no century 21 office you could go to where you can buy land for your new factory or whatever else. There's no free labor force. People are tied in, in, in serfdom or in other kinds of contracts or apprenticeships or whatever. They're tied. They're bound to, to different places. Nobody moves more than three kilometers from their home. The, the Industrial Revolution shreds the old ways of seeing one another. Uh, and uh, along with it come enclosure movements and uh, sabotage, you know, basically uh, poor laws and a whole bunch of attempts to stop this thing from happening uh, that fail. And so our brains, the brains you, you just described, Jose, uh, were formed back in 1750-ish, uh, give or take 100 years. Like, like that, that's the era when this mindset was forged. And we don't have a way of unseeing this mindset. We, we, we can't easily put our brains in the pre-industrial mindset. And then anytime you say that, everybody's like, oh, you just want to be Rousseau's noble savage, or that would never work. Or there's a whole bunch of immediate disclaimers for, well, that's stupid. Why would you ever want to you know, do that? And a piece of our conversations here that comes back over and over again, that is something that I'm really interested in as well, is how do we match the best of the new with the best of the old? How do we, how do we take our global connectivity and the ability to have conversations like we do every Thursday and a couple other calls every week, uh, sort of moving things forward little by little and sorting out our own thoughts by expressing them to, to others, along with the actual sacredness and, and visions of, of you know, uh, indigenous societies around the world that, ha that see things very differently from us. How do we let go of some of the suppositions of our own society and yet still make our way through our own society to make changes? Like, we need to actually cause some sorts of catalytic change in the present system that we're busy living in, the system that keeps us alive, the system that we probably all need to earn some salary to stay alive inside of. How do we how do we cause change? So I, I the love system the doesn't keep us alive. We are the system. Yeah. Well, we're not. It, well, it's not a system that is independent of us. We are the same thing, and but the, but and that's part learn? of the language, right? But the way to step out of the system these days is to go join an ashram or something like like this. It's very hard to step out of the system. Well, uh, the people who like um, Heike, what's her name? The woman who lives with no money. Um, she's trying it. There's a couple other experiments out there. But boy, these are real one offs. Heike Schwermer, I think I'll look her up. I don't know that we need to go. I don't think that the, the solution is for one person or a group of people to step out of the current system. But for all of us to start to talk about the fact that the system as it is, is not a viable thing. And that it was created, as you just clearly stated, it was created by our desire to grow. And we've grown. And we've learned that growing to the stage that we've grown is suicide. So let's stop growing and let's start living. And let's find the conversations and the right way of describing that living, not by trying to get rid of the thing that we've got, but by recognizing that living isn't what we're doing. We've been simply trying to grow. Well, we've been eaten by a, a growth mentality that's part and parcel of the thing that showed up with industrialization, capitalism, and consumerism. Uh, Dave. Yeah, I don't know the growth thing. I mean, I, 
it, it does feel it's hard for me to kind of sit in this room and and think about growth is bad and then think about like having been in Burkina Faso and think of growth is bad, right? I mean, growth being a bad thing is a first world problem, right? It's been a really good thing for most of the world, I think. Um, and so certainly if you look at, you know, maternal death rates and, you know, hunger and things like that, the distribution of economic wealth across the world, which has been driven by growth, seems like it's helped a lot of people. Um, that's why I'm a little bit frustrated with the climate change conversation because, you know, for most of the world, climate change is still not the biggest problem, right? It's, you know, a serious problem, but there's a bunch of those. Um, so when we focus, you know, get this mono focus on something, then then I think we, you know, we, we distort what the experience of a whole bunch of the world is about. And so, I mean, we probably need a reallocation. You know, there's notion that we have enough in the world if we could share it right seems kind of true. We just don't know how to share it right, I think. Um, anyway, so I, I, you know, I, I think it's, I was thinking about like the World Bank and and Bretton Woods and and the growth, uh, the growth strategies of the, of the Washington consensus. And they kind of worked, you know? And so we may, we may want to change them. We may want to temper them and stuff, but it's, you know, it's hard to say they were a bad decision. It's kind of like the Green Revolution. It's like, was it a bad decision or did we just carry it on too far? You know, um, they, you know, You've just uh, torn the lid off another great Pandora's box, Dave. Thank you. And 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 I'm I'm actually thinking that growth is a really uh, good OGME yeah. topic for a call in a couple Everybody. weeks. Uh, maybe we should come back there. I'm just going to mute Doug because I think that audio is coming from Doug's channel. I mean, one thing I'd love to kind of I don't know if anybody else is so like the notion that land we we made land a commodity. I think it's really interesting in the enclosure stuff. The land is genuinely genuinely is scarce merit mostly right we don't get to create more of it um actually and so maybe don't don't tell that to the dutch but keep going yeah well they, they get you know, you're still only creating a little bits and pieces you're not creating tons more you're not doubling it or anything like that but uh, but uh, there's more, a whole, more than half their country is actually polders only in holland not in a global sense we yeah, have yeah. double the land mass of the world All right. um so but we have a whole bunch of things in 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 our society that are abundant, right? And we've got a whole bunch of rules that make them scarce, right? So intellectual property rules, things like that. Um, and so like, even if we just started with the things that ought to be abundant, you know, kind of software code, um, and make, you know, the, if we could manage those commons as for the things that are genuinely abundant, that genuinely have zero, zero marginal cost of distribution, right it seems like we would be a lot farther downstream um and we're not even very good at that right we don't really have the systems that allow us to improve these things or and we don't and we don't have a focus on it we don't you know abundant abundant love or abundant empathy abundant excitement you know um those aren't big motivators in our society um for some reason um thanks dave i, I wanted to uh, add one thing also um to what you were saying earlier, which is like in Bangladesh, which is a hugely populous country, two thirds of the country is within like five feet of sea level. Like when 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 seas rise, Bangladesh has to move people around someplace and there's gonna be a huge problem. I think that issue is not necessarily on every Bangladeshi's mind. They're like worried about how do I feed my family? How do I whatever, whatever. But, but this is gonna whack Bangladesh and a bunch of other countries really, really hard, never mind other climate disasters that are going to they are going to be less coastally related and more equally distributed around the earth and hitting everybody in different ways. Um, and then we haven't talked about how a Bangladesh just rose up and said, hey, dictator, you got to go and got rid of their prime minister, who had been basically a dictator for 50 years. Uh, she fled and now they've got to find their way to something better. They took Muhammad Yunus and said, hey, come back and help us because uh, she had basically uh, taken apart Eunice's authority. He was kind of an exile. Uh, he has come back and has been, has kind of been tasked or picked up the role of trying to, to create some stability in the middle of it and turn things over to the, to the young people to make a new government and do everything else. But Bangladesh is in a moment of turmoil that's maybe happy turmoil. And one of the, this is sorry to bring in a completely different tangent. One of the things that was really disheartening to me in the last couple of decades was watching the Arab Spring lead to zero new fruitful great governments across Northern Africa, for example. Like we need to figure out some uh, add water and mix 
epoxy version of how to build a new government that actually is functional and works. Uh, and uh, it's not happening well. So um, back to our regularly scheduled program, which was already in progress, Renzi. Um, so we do live on a self-contained system. Everything's finite, obviously, right? Um, it's regenerative as well. But we the growth mindset is is tied to math. It's tied to uh, our way of exchanging um, and converting, you know, all of the stuff into points. And so the um, we extract stuff and we create new, more valuable uh, things: houses, buildings, uh, you know, and other assets. And so the 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 need to extract to constantly extract and produce things uh, is tied to the need for more points. And then, of course, uh, you have the banks creating the points via credit. And in order to pay them their interest, the existing currency, the existing points don't exist. And so by extension, you need to extract more and produce more assets in order for that. Uh, those previous points that were uh, um, created and flowed to the um, to the interest has to keep growing. So not only do the points, the currency grows, but so do the assets, right? So do the, the amount of stuff that we extracted and, and combine into, into stuff. And so what we find is we find ourselves producing more houses, more buildings and more infrastructure. And then of course, <laughs> uh, the, the worst part is blowing shit up so that we could rebuild them again. Uh, so we can continue that cycle of extraction and production all for the uh, sake of chasing these, uh, uh, these fucking points. And so it's the point system that we're basing on the extraction and exchange of stuff. That is the problem, gentlemen. Like what I'm saying is that the, the points need not be done that way anymore. And so if we separate the points from the stuff, we don't longer have to be in a growth mindset. We don't no longer have to create, uh, create and extract more stuff just simply so that we can, can maintain this stable uh, or, or, or attempt to stabilize the, the point system, which it never is. Um, so that's the game we're playing. So we have to, until we, we uh, are able to take away the um, incentives of giving points to the people who've, who've claimed the private resources, the oil, the trees, until we do that, um, we're going to be in this growth mindset. We're, we're still trapped in that. It's, it's, it's math. It's, it's, it's out of our control. It, 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 the, uh, all the, in, if, if one agent steps out, uh, one oil producer says, you know, we're going to nationalize this, whatever, give it to the people. Well, you're still incentives. You still have another group who have now uh, we're benefiting and extracting that for the points. And so you didn't do anything. You didn't by socializing things. You didn't really change the game. All you merely did is just change the distributed the ownership uh, and the privileges of ownership. And so it's this idea of owning things for money that we have to get rid of uh, money. Currency can simply give, be given and created to people on different metrics that value and enable life rather than uh, in, enable and, and encourage extraction and trade. Those are, you know, we don't need to encourage production and trade. People will naturally produce because we want to do things. We're creative. We have energy. We, we want to apply it in the world. So we don't need a small group of people to control both our stuff and our labor towards, you know, chasing these, this goddamn sick game of points. One of the one of the many things that people can't envision in pre-industrial life is that people actually did stuff productively without the threat of unemployment or the lack of money or any of those kinds of things. That people actually were productive in the world without these external extrinsic motivators. It's like there's a whole mess of people on the planet who don't believe that's even a thing that that's possible. That that it's money and the the threat of starvation that cause people to go work, which is in part in part made true by the vast number of bullshit jobs and underpaid uh, 3D and 4D jobs, dirty, dangerous, and disgusting jobs that poor people have to do. There's a whole thread there as well. Let's see. Just uh, wanted to, to comment on what David said about, um, about uh, how growth isn't so bad. Um, I think growth, as far as technological understanding and knowledge, has been great. We've learned to do so much more than we were capable of doing. But at the same time, I think that the the millions of buffalo that we killed, um, the millions of Native Americans that we killed, uh, the beaver, you name it, um, here in North America alone, never mind everywhere else where we have extracted um, 
I think that just because there are some of us who benefit from that extraction doesn't mean that, that was a healthy process. Um, and most of it was unhealthy. Most of it was not done for the purposes of life, but but for what um, was Ramsey was just describing, um, for the sake of simply winning at the game uh, of money. And so, I, I think I think we need to kind of keep that in check. That there's different kinds of growth, and for the most part, the growth that we've done has been done for the wrong reasons, not the right reasons. It hasn't been to distribute wealth. It hasn't been to make people's lives better. In most cases, people in the world that are working are simply surviving at low wages because the extraction is happening at their cost. A piece of our call today has been a philosophical salon that would be familiar and happy in lots of sort of socio-political econo conversations or academic spaces, except we're not providing sort of the frameworks and the backing. I, th I think we're, I think we're enthusiastically searching for frameworks. It would be nice to, um, to be more concrete about it. Uh, Kevin is being concrete about it by working on the road at, you know, by hitting where the rubber meets the road with local communities, doing local things and working uh, on uh, non-timber forest goods, on uh, lending circles and other, other kinds of financial instruments that actually step outside of, of traditional vehicles, et cetera, still within the money system, still within the current models of land ownership, et cetera. But, um, but that's really cool. Um, what, what else might we do over time is, is coming to mind. Um, and I, I put in a, a question, I think I mentioned on an OGM call before about the beaver. Um, so uh, men's top hats used to be made out of felted beaver, beaver fur, uh, and they were so popular that the beaver was trapped out. There's a town named Astoria, which is where the Columbia River meets the Pacific Ocean, which was Astor's trading post for beaver pelts uh, out of the Pacific Northwest, which got trapped out. And then one day, um, uh, and then one day, Prince Albert uh, wore a silk top hat. And pretty, I, I'm probably over generalizing and over specifying, but kind of overnight, <clears throat> the cool thing to wear, because you know how fashions are, was a silk hat, not a, not a beaver hat. And the beaver got spared because the silkworms took, bear, you know, bore the load for a while, but, but silk hats were suddenly in, uh, beaver was out. And beaver coats, yeah, they had a lot of competition from other kinds of coats. There were, there were not a lot of other unique uses for beaver skins at that time. Anyway, Stacey. An idea for an experiment. Um, maybe ask maybe ask AI to break this call down into possible future calls and put it on the OGM list and see get like a sign up sheet for who might be interested in which calls. Love that. Um, so I will have the transcript and the AI summary uh, in, in my hands in the next couple of hours from Zoom. Would anybody like to undertake that project? Anybody want to feed it, feed it to the maw of the beast? Kevin? Yeah. Uh, Kevin, you're muted. Kevin, you're still muted. It's, it's, uh, anyway, I'll be glad to be part of the group doing it for sure. I don't want to sign up to do all of it, but I'm, I will work with folks on it. Yeah. If other people don't show up, I'll wait till somebody else shows up. So there we cool. go. So Carl, it sounds like you'd like to give that a swing. Yeah. So okay. Carl, oh, great. Great. Carl, Thank you. Well, Carl plus then we, Kevin, then we have two. Why don't you guys connect and anybody else who wants to connect with either Carl or Kevin and join in? That'd be great. great. Thanks, Stacey. Um, other thoughts? Where does this put us? I like the direction of, of how do we do this rather than simply talk about it. Um, and uh, that's the work. That's the work we're trying to do as well. Though it's uh, it's not only it's hard to talk about it. It's harder to do. Um, and so the the question is how how do we do it uh, in a in a in community and not just a, a handful of us do it alone. 
Um, and so that would be a, a conversation that I'd like to entertain. Mm. And just, just to munch things together, I think there's a very interesting opportunity for Harris, Walls, and Democrats to pick up and not get back on the train of, oh, we're just going to, let's go run a majority and then let's go run the 1970s Democratic platform over again uh, and do that, but rather to rethink some of these issues and to use this administration as a transition uh, to figure out how to get people happy again and connected again and et cetera, et cetera, without sticking to the standard measures of success, which would be the Dow Jones, uh, the the rate of inflation and the discount rate and a couple other stupid things that we're still, we're still like, hey, the, uh, you know, uh, Japan does something funny last week. Uh, it's it's uh, stock market plunges. And then the next Monday, like hell, all hell breaks loose in the markets in a very weird way. I, I did not see there was any need for that kind of a drop, but I'm not a stock analyst, but I see the stock, the stock markets as more emotional than rational in many, in many cases. Anyway, so, so how might we help the administration and other progressives and other non-progressives steer better for the visions that we're putting forward here? Because I think somebody out there is probably open to uh, interesting new programs. Dave. Okay, I was going to just sticking this into the to the, I mentioned earlier, but the notion of the bioregionalism seems to me to be kind of an interesting layer of of thought, and you know it's 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 in, it's interesting to me. So again, if you if what we really need to do is just move us from forty eight percent to fifty four percent, you know, then then that's a different problem than you know we have to build an entire new interstate system, you know, and and so what you know what is that marginal switch maybe is is, is an interesting question to me and. If if our if we think of our governance systems as this complicated stack and mix mess of of all kinds of different decision making processes, right? The the federal and the state and the county and the city and the corporate and the nonprofit and the you know neighborhood development and the utilities and you know they're the ones that make decisions and we and we start to lay on that a decision making area that's around bioregions, like the re, re, reflects the living systems kind of is is the notion. Um, how, how much does that change our society and the way we perceive our society? And so Samantha Power and company have done this BioFi.Earth book, which I, I think is kind of like a Bretton Woods for bioregions. You know, they're trying to establish a new World Bank and IMF and, you know, IFC and all these different kinds of entities that are bioregionally focused. That's my interpretation. Somebody else is going to have a better interpretation. But it's an interesting kind of analysis of what we could be doing. And I think there are probably some other ones. And so anyway, I'd be... If anybody ever wants to get in conversations around how do we think about bioregions and bioregional change, I think that would be interesting. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, we're building a bioregional currency uh, that uh, I'd love to talk to you about, Dave. Super. Um, we're nearing the end of our time together, and I, I think perhaps we turn to Master Homer and see if uh, he's master. Got... <laughs> yes. See if let's he's got. Let's some... not use that that title. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've had a really. I've been scanning poems this whole call. I got a whole bunch, but I'm gonna go with with uh, some quotes from David Corton from a 2006 talk at uh, the San Francisco Green Festival. Aren't corporations just communities of people? Without dismissing the many wonderful and well-intentioned people working inside corporations, this argument misses a critical point. In a publicly traded institution, the people, including the CEO, are all employees of the institution with few, if any, individual rights. They are paid to serve the institution at its pleasure, required to leave their personal values at the door, and subject to instant arbitrary dismissal without recourse. These are not the qualities we normally associate with community. We are talking here about an institution of enormous power governed by absentee owners and unaccountable managers in the business of converting the life energy of people and nature into money for the short-term financial gain of already wealthy shareholders and managers without regard to human or natural consequences. In other words, we best think of the publicly traded limited liability corporation as a gigantic pool of money with an artificial legal personality 
required to behave by law like a sociopath. PR images aside, the publicly traded corporation is a destroyer of community and a powerful engine of wealth concentration in a world desperately in need of community and equity. Amen. Do you have well anything said. about puppies and unicorns to cheer us <laughs> up on the way out? I have I have a a, a, a gif of uh, unicorns spreading rainbows if you want. <laughs> you know, that'll completely do. That'll completely do. Um, thanks, Kim. Judy. Judy wanted to say something. I think. Oh, please, Judy. No. No, just I appreciate what what you said, Kim. Uh, it's not me. That's David Corton. I I took those notes at uh, the Green Festival in two thousand six when he was speaking there. And uh, oh, but well said. Thank can you. you post those to the OGM list, please? I can. Thanks. I can indeed. Thanks. Any um, any final thoughts from anyone? Are we good with the topic of growth as a topic in a couple of weeks? I think we've been there a bit before, but I think focusing on it um, a little would be useful. Judy. I was just going to say, it, it occurs to me that as we deal with all of these ponderous and troublesome topics, that some conversation at some point about resilience and maintenance of optimism would be an appropriate counterpoint to this situation that we're all facing. So kind of uh, mental health in the polypocalypse? <laughs> mental health sounds pretty analytical, but, but something, I don't know, just, I don't know, restorative psychology, I guess, would be a term I would throw together having not defined it. <laughs> but I just think that this the sense of, of doom in the world is high and the apprehension about it prevents creative action to change it. And if we could somehow distill a little of that, it would be interesting. So how do we keep it together? <clears throat> Did anybody ever see Bowfinger? It's a, it's yeah. a, it's a, Steve Martin was Steve Martin in that. that was from Eddie, the Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy. It's a mediocre Eddie Murphy movie. He's a, he's a B film producer, but during the movie and he's, he, his therapist plays a big role in the movie. He's like kind of crazy. Um, but, but his catchphrase is keep it together, keep it together. And, and, and so I, I just love that. And every now and then I'll be like, keep it together, keep it together. Well, and to Judy's point, I mean, the Harris Walls campaign is about bringing back the joy. And I think that's great. <laughs> well, it, this actually does remind me, you know, I was in Austin two weeks ago facilitating uh, a, two companies just merged. A, a, a big French company bought a smaller American cybersecurity firm. And so I'm working with the executive committee. This is the senior leadership of the organization. And we, we asked them, we're going to do a thought experiment. Um, I had a picture of the TARDIS. There's a, there's a wonderful artist in Sebastopol who's created a, a, a replica of the TARDIS. And I had a picture that I took and no one there knew what it was. So that didn't actually work. But I said, we're going to ask you to go forward to Q4 2026. And the integration has been amazingly successful. Innovation is up. Employees are highly engaged. Investors are happy. Your stock is on the rise. It's, it's just a humming place. It's fantastic. What did, and you're going to be interviewed by a reporter from the Financial Times who's going to ask you, what did you do? How did you make this happen? And it took over an hour and a half to get people into the imaginal space because they kept getting stuck with, well, we can't do that because of what's going on right now. And if we're going to solve or resolve or, or have any impact on making the world better as opposed to worse, we have to let go of the current level of problem solving thinking and step into if this was working for everybody, for all life, if, if this was really focused on creating well-being at every level of scale, what would we be doing? What would it look like if we're going to then reverse engineer and figure that out? And people get really caught up in the, I can't do that because things are so bad right now. And there's such a focus on mental doom scrolling. It, it, doom scrolling shows up in conversation all the time. It's not just on, online, you know? And being able to step out of that and be in a place of, we've got to think, we aim really high. And don't don't worry if you'll say you're being idealistic or utopian, because if you don't aim high enough, you're never going to clear the fence. You know, when 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 baseball player, I hate to use sports analogy, but you know, 
if you're going to throw a ball over a fence, you got to aim high. If you throw it at the fence, it's going to hit and going to land the ground. We got to aim really high. You mentioned earlier, Jerry, and this will come up in, in uh, the talk with Liz. If you want to have sustainable land practices, you have to be there for hundreds of years. It takes 2,000 years to grow a sequoia to full maturity. Why aren't we thinking in 2,000 year increments? We're cutting down sequoia forests, clear cutting them, and planting trees, tree farms. This is not a way to live. So, what would it look like to restore well being to the entire planet at every level of living system? That to me is a really interesting inquiry, and it sidesteps or, or pushes off till later how to solve today's current problems. Because if we don't have a really uh, robust view and imaginative view of what that looks like, we'll never be able to to make progress very effectively in what we're facing today. That's my take on it anyway. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to post uh, Glenn Thomas, who worked for Ray Anderson. He actually put together a poem, Tomorrow's Child. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but <laughs> that's also appropriate for today. You muted, and Jerry. Almost every, almost every recording you see of Ray Anderson, he recites it, so you can hear it in his words. Are you putting it in the chat, or do you want to put it on the OGM list? Maybe both. Yeah. I'll put it in the chat right now. It sounds familiar. I think I have a... Tomorrow's Child is read by Ray Anderson. There we go. Um, if this link still works... It should be a link. And the link works. Good. <clears throat> I got to run. Ah. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Love this call. Really appreciate it. I appreciate you.